uh, church. And right now I want to welcome also all of our Dublin family. Family in Dublin, we love you too. <laughs> Missed you guys also. And to everyone watching online, it's so good uh, that you are here with us. It is the second day of September, everybody. Which means two things. One, September, September brings in two things. One, number one, the end of summer. Summer is gone. It's over. It's, it's done for. And what a great summer we had. I mean, come on. Wasn't it like the best summer ever? If only summer like that could be like that every single year. I mean, honestly, you wouldn't have enough space to fit all the people who want to come and move to Ireland. The second thing that term brings is our kids go back to school. Yay! Yes. I mean, it's a great thing to spend a whole month with your kids, but you know, it makes September even more of a blessing. <clears throat> I love you from over here. You now go there. And... Uh, and September is a season, it's the beginning of autumn, it's a transition time. It's when we get back into routine, it's when we get a, a sense of, you know, just getting back into, into life as we know it. And I want to say that as we move into this new season, not just physically in September and autumn, but spiritually, I believe that God is bringing us as a church, uh, both here in Navin and in Dublin, into a new season. I just want to say to you, as we approach this new season, I just get a sense that we are strong as a church and that we are excited. We're strong and we're, we're excited. We're anticipating that God is about to do something. And I can't shake this feeling of we're on the precipice, we're on the cusp, we're on the edge of God doing something great. So I'm just really excited, really grateful for the season that we've had, for the summer season, for all the great things and cool things that we've got to do in our families and as a church. But I look forward to the future with a sense of strength and excitement. And kind of, it's in that kind of vein that I want to bring to you a new series that we're launching today. And uh, we didn't really have time to uh, update you or give you a heads up this series because no one knew this series except me. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a four-part series that we're going to be doing called I Am Blessed. I Am Blessed. Say with me. I, I am, am Blessed. blessed. And what we're going to be doing in this series, we're going to be looking at blessing but from a different perspective. We've done series, we do a series, we have done a series in the past called The Blessed Life, which is primarily about giving, but it applies to every part of life. But I don't, I don't want to focus in on, on how we're blessed, we're blessing, that whole thing. I want to focus on how we're blessed and why we're blessed. And then at the end, we'll get a little bit to, you know, in the series as to what we're blessed for. What we're going to be doing is we're going to take a little journey because we're going to use one chapter of the scripture for the next four weeks. We're going to stay in one chapter. We're going to look at Psalm 103. So I want to encourage you, we're going to look at verse 1 to 5 in just a few minutes but over the next three weeks after today, four weeks including today, we're going to be unpacking part by part, step by step, this incredible psalm, Psalm 103. It's going to be a journey. I just believe as we get to the end of it, something, things may not change in our circumstances, but something's going to change in our character where even if we can't say it with confidence or conviction today, my prayer for us as a church, no matter who we are, where we come from, what we're going through, is that at the end of week four, we can say in a de declaration sense, I I'm blessed. Not a fake kind of, yeah, I'm blessed, but a real kind of deep-seated conviction that because of what God has done for me, no matter what I go through, I am blessed. So I had this happen to me, you know, this, this, this tenuous reality of, of circumstances not really being a blessing and having to really, you know, wrestle or grab with the idea of being blessed on my way back home. Uh, last uh, Wednesday, we were in Hawaii, which is a blessing, as you know. And uh, we're on our way back home, which if you don't know where Hawaii is, it's the, literally almost halfway around the world. I was trying to explain this to my uh, son, David, the other day. I showed him the globe and I said, here's Ireland. And you go the whole way around the globe and almost like literally halfway in the world is, uh, is, is Hawaii. We're 11 hours difference in time, almost 12 hours, a complete uh, you know, half some covers of the earth. And, and so getting there and getting back from there, it's a long way. Getting there and getting back from there for th with three young boys is hard work. We left Hawaii at 9 p.m. On a, on, a, on, a, on a Wednesday night. We had a six and a half hour flight to San Francisco. We had a four hour layover in San Francisco whereby we got another six and a half hour flight to Washington Dulles whereby we're about to have another six hour flight back to Dublin. Which, you know, okay, it's long, but we're going to get through this. Well, we gotten through the, the Hawaii to San Francisco leg. We gotten through the, Was the San Francisco to Washington leg. We take off from Washington. It's the home stretch. We just cannot wait to get home. We can smell the Emerald Green Islands. You know what I'm saying? I can smell Ireland. And I uh, just cannot wait to get home. We're just leaving the coast of America and the Atlantic when all of a sudden the captain comes on and says, uh, sorry folks, we have to divert course. We're not going to be able to go to Dublin. We have a technical issue. We have to uh, basically conduct an emergency landing. 
which when you hear that, you kind of go, oh, okay, back to my reading, back to my movie, until as we're landing, literally coming in the runway in Newark, which is New York, and we see like literally 25 fire engines with lights blazing. They're all sitting there waiting for us as we land, they kind of drive beside us on the opposite runway, and we're thinking, okay, maybe this is a little bit serious. We get to the gate, we're trying to figure out what we've got to do. They, they ask us to disembark, we all get off the plane, we, we, we walk into the terminal, Every, you know, it's literally at this point, one o'clock in the morning, everyone's tired, then we get a word that the pilot has timed out, so he has to leave, he can't fly the plane anymore, it's chaos for a while. And the people who are sitting beside us in the plane, they're, you know, complaining, oh, I can't believe this, they're blaming the company and blaming the weather and blaming, you know, all sorts of things. We find out in the end that what actually had went wrong was the airspeed indicator, which is, was broken, which if you know anything about flying, or love to watch, like I do, aircraft investigation. A lot of airplanes crash, a lot of people die when there's a problem with the airspeed in the care. So it's quite a serious thing. And uh, as we get in the, back in the plane, we're getting ready to take off. Same airplane to fix the problem. I'm a man of faith. I'm not really worried. I know my time has not come. We're getting to Dublin. Do you know what I'm saying? As far as I'm concerned, you're all okay. Because I know I'm okay. Do you know what I'm saying? I know who I am. I know where I'm going. I know God's got extraordinary purpose in my life. I am not worried. And I wasn't. But the person beside me, he was kind of freaking out. I said, you know what? I said, you know, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to crash and die over the Atlantic Ocean just because you're trying to get somewhere, you know, on a schedule? Or would you prefer the fact that you're safe and alive and going to get there a little bit later, but arrive alive? See, I was trying to explain to him that, you know, the circumstances weren't favorable and, 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 and they could cause us to feel bitter, cause him and cause me to get upset. But, you know, as I sat there in my seat, actually I was doing my soap journal uh, as we got back in the plane, I began to realize, you know what? I am blessed. I'm here with my family. I'm healthy. I'm alive. They're healthy and alive. We're on an airplane. We just had the opportunity to leave our country and go on a holiday. Something that only like 2% of the entire world's population get to do. We just came from Hawaii. I mean, come on. Who wants to go to Hawaii? It's incredible. It's supposed to be paradise. It's amazing. Like, you know, no matter what circumstances come at me, which I just this intense sense of God's presence with me in that plane. No matter what the world could throw at me at that moment, I um, blessed. Why? Because blessing we're going to see isn't, isn't what happens to us, it's what has happened within us. You see, you are blessed. You're blessed. Every single one of you in this place, you're blessed. You're blessed with the friendships you have, both in this church and outside this church. You're blessed if you're, if you're married. You're blessed with the opportunity to study and be in school. You're blessed with the job that you have. You're blessed with your health. You're blessed with your family. You're blessed to live in this great nation. You're blessed to be part of this great church. You're blessed. You're blessed for many, many reasons. But sometimes we kind of get confused as to what the difference is between blessings and being blessed. And there is a difference. Because oftentimes you can hear people who aren't even Christ followers, meaning they don't really have a relationship with God. Maybe you're in that place today, you're here, and you don't really have a personal relationship with Jesus. You're on this faith journey, and we just want to say you're so welcome, we're so glad you're here today. This, this is for you. But, you know, sometimes we hear people who don't even have a relationship with God, but will say things like, you know, I have, you know so many blessings, or I'm grateful for the blessings in my life. And when they say that, you know what they mean. They're talking about things that have happened, almost like lucky charms. Things have happened in their life, good things, and people refer to good things as blessings. There's a difference between blessings and being blessed. You see, being blessed comes as a result of having a relationship with Jesus. For every single one of you in this room who right now has put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, I can say with absolute confidence, no matter what you're going through, whether you're here in this room, watching online, or watching in Dublin, you are blessed. You're blessed. Because when you have Jesus, you have it all. I mean, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals enough. Yeah, come on, let's get excited about that fact. And because we have a relationship with him, because he is for us, because he's got all the things that we know, all the things that we believe in, we are blessed. See, being blessed is more than just random luck. Blessings, random luck. You know, like I, 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 got, you know, I won the draw in the credit union and got a new car. Blessings, random luck. But being blessed is more than random luck. Being blessed is ridiculous favor. I mean, come on, you've probably experienced in your life or if you're here and you're not yet a believer, you know those Christians and how annoying they are because it seems like someone is following them around working out things for their good. Not that everything that happens is good, but even in the not so good stuff, somehow God, you may not attribute to God, but somehow God is working uh, in their lives 
for ridiculous favors. It happens all the time to me when people who I know, friends and family, kind of go, how did that happen? I go, you know what? I'm blessed. I didn't orchestrate this. I'm not lucky. I am blessed. God is working on my behalf for me. See, being blessed is not, not a, a situational circumstance that happens to us. Being blessed is a reality that we experience even when we lack blessings. I say that again. Being blessed is a reality that we experience even when on the surface we're lacking the blessings. We're not seeing the blessings. We're not seeing maybe the breakthroughs. We're not seeing the vision just yet, but still we are blessed because being blessed isn't when, when something you know, good happens for us. Being blessed is the reality of who we are because of what God has done for us through his son, Christ Jesus. Now, when you look in the scriptures, kind of laying a little bit of foundation for the series here, there's two uh, words, primary words, one in Greek, one in Hebrew, that describe the word blessed. The first word is the, uh, the Greek word. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so whenever you read the word blessed or blessing or blessed in the Greek New Testament, the word there is the word makarios. And I love this because the word makarios literally in Greek means happy. The word blessed in the Bible, in the scripture, literally means happy. So in Jesus' fa famous story, you know, he's on the... Uh, He's on a mountain one day. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And he's teaching the people. And he gets to this point where, you, where we call the Beatitudes. You've heard these, remember? Blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. And, and, and what he's saying is happy are those. Happy are those. Happy are those. And what's funny is when you understand it like that, you read it like that, you say blessed, happy are those who mourn. That doesn't make sense. Because circumstantially, they're mourning, right? Some bad stuff has happened to them. But no matter how bad circumstances get, still the truth is the reality of their relationship with God makes it possible for them to be blessed, to be happy. Come on, clap along with me. If happiness... Oh, what's the song? I can't remember it. I'm not going to sing it. Pharrell Williams is too high. Clap along with me if happiness... Anyway, so... The first word is the word happy. To be. So to be blessed, defini def definition of blessed, blessed equals, first of all, happy. Now when you look in the Old Testament, you know, the kind of precursor to the new, the, the foundation for the new, there's another word in Hebrew, you've heard this word, which is the word shalom. Shal it sounds cool, doesn't it? Shalom. Kind of sounds like native Indian, like shalom. How? You know? And, and, and that word shalom, you know, you've probably seen it written down places. There's actually, I've seen it in Ireland, some homes are called shalom, you know? And, and uh, myself and my oldest son, we had this tradition ever since he was like, I don't know, two. Every single night after we pray and I took him in, he'd always say, shalom. And I'll say shalom back. I think it's because when he was like two or three, he went to kids' church and someone told him what it meant and it impacted his life so much. But literally, what the word, word shalom means, it's a hard word to translate because it can mean peace, it can mean joy, it can mean satisfaction. The word shalom, literally, if we try to translate into one English word, it would literally mean whole. To be blessed means to be whole, to be whole, to be complete, to be satisfied. We talk about the fact that I am blessed. What we're talking about is ble being blessed equals I am happy and I am whole. When we say that God wants for you and I to be blessed, what we're saying is God wants for you to be happy and be whole. I mean, how many of us in this room want to live happy and whole lives? It's what it means to be a Christ follower. Being a Christ follower does not mean we're a religious depressant who has some kind of sense of obligation in our entire lives trying to you know, uh, you know, self-flagellate or, or inflict punishment on ourselves because of our sins. No, we recognize that he who, who is out without sin became sin on our behalf. So that we who are far from God haven't been brought near to God. We've been blessed by God. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been transformed and changed. The Jamie that stands before you today is not the Jamie that was here. I want to go away because we're constantly growing and transforming by the power of God's Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm grateful to God that he's working in my life and I'm changing. And if you're married today, you should be grateful too for your spouse that they're changing too or should be changing. As we cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit, there's an inner reality that has changed us and guarantees two things for us. Number one, we can be happy in all occasions and all circumstances, no matter what we go through, because we're whole, because of what Jesus has done for us. To be blessed means that we are both happy and also, as the next 
three weeks unfold as we get our teeth into this series, really what we're trying to unpack is what does it mean? What does it look like? How can we move closer to God and not just know, but experience this happiness and this wholeness? And the good news is that starts today. So the question we're asking is, how are we blessed? How? How is it? What has God done on our behalf that we could be happy and home? What we're going to do is going to turn to that Psalm right now, Psalm 103, verse 1 to 5. The notes are in the Bible app, so you're going to open the Bible app, click in events, find Lighthouse Church Navin, click in that, and all the notes from today's message are there. If you're going to follow along with me now or look at them later on, we're going to look in Psalm 103, in the next four weeks, we're going to unpack the entire psalm. But today, the first segment, we're going to look at verse 1 to verse 5. Here's what the first verse says. This is what, how David, who wrote this psalm, how he opens up. He says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Verse 2. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Some powerful verses, right? Let's let's backtrack to verse 1 and begin to unpack What is it David is trying to say to us as an audience today? What is God trying to say to us through his word today? Well, first of all, I want you to see in verse one is that David is making a statement. Praise the Lord, he says, my soul. He's speaking to himself. He's going through some difficult circumstances, as I've alluded to already. Things around him aren't really going according to plan. Maybe he doesn't have many blessings in his life right now, but still he is resting with this tension, understanding that somehow because of his proximity to God, because of his relationship with God, he is blessed. And he does something that I think is so important that all of us have to be proactive in doing when we find ourselves in difficult times, and that is this. He adjusts his focus. Take a note, write this down. He adjusts his focus. He chooses to zoom in. He chooses to lean. He chooses to emphasize. He chooses what he allows his mind and his soul to be consumed with. He, he chooses to adjust his focus to God. He doesn't whine about what he's going through. He doesn't you know, allow the struggles that are before him to affect you know, who, who, how he sees himself, who he is, or who God is. Rather, he adjusts his focus to God. Why? Because focus is a powerful thing. I don't know if you've realized this through life experience, But, you know, you live a while and what you'll see is that very often where our focus is, our feet will follow. Remember years ago, a pastor came to Ireland. He was doing a Bible study. His son was a state trooper in the U.S. He was uh, basically a road policeman. He would basically, his whole job was road-related stuff. And he talked about about how, you know, focus is a powerful thing because one of the things that killed a lot of state troops at the time was when, the, the pe- when people were driving, especially on what they'd call small roads. For us, it's like a normal road. You know, two lanes, no, no concrete barrier in the middle. Sometimes what happens, people would get so freaked out by this, the, the patrol car, <clears throat> by the squad car, that without raising, because they were looking at it, they didn't raise their hands, or actually pulling the steering wheel over the line. And there'd been a number of fatalities where troopers were killed just because people were looking at them, freaking out, and slowly pulling their hands towards where looking. See, where our focus is, very often our feet will follow. If we allow our lives to be consumed with sin and the pursuit of sin, even if we're not doing it with our hands, even if we're not physically acting it out, if we allow our focus by what we watch, what we listen to, and who we hang around with to become those things, every single time our feet will follow. The same is true in a positive sense. When we make God our focus, when we Get in his word. Oh, we you know, create time for prayer. As we focus upon him, also our feet follow. See, David, he, you know, he, he, he decides that in this season of turmoil, he's going to turn and he's going to praise God. And David's praise focused on the good things that God was doing in him and for him. 
It, it, was, it would be easy for him to complain about all the things that weren't working, but he makes a decision to focus on all the things that God is doing. For him. I want to encourage you that we need to do the same thing. We need, to, we, need to, we need to take control of our lens, what we allow into our soul what we watch, what we listen to, how we interpret events and make sure that what we're seeing and experiencing isn't being interpreted through the lens of our world because it's a very negative lens. And you know, if you watch the news, everything's always negative. But through the, it needs to be interpreted through the lens of faith, the lens of God's word. David, first of all, adjusts his focus. And then what he does, number two, and this is very important, is he does some what I call soul speak. Soul speak. So I've learned that even if you don't speak a foreign language, you can speak three languages. The first language you speak is the native tongue that you have. Okay, so you speak one language, you know that. The second language you have is we believe that when we experience this phenomenon called the baptism of the Holy Spirit and God comes upon us in power, we can speak in a heavenly language. It's a personal direct line that we have with God. You know, in fact, you know, you know, brain doctors have done research on this. They've scanned people's brains as they're praying in tongues and found that there's a part of our brain that lights up, that never lights up only when we're praying. That kind of prayer language is powerful. And, you know, let me tell you something. When you're going to difficult times, you, you thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit and your ability to express that to speak in tongues. So you can speak your native tongue. You can speak in heavenly tongues. And the third thing you use, you can speak soul. I don't talk about, you know, American music. You can speak to your soul. Because I don't know if you realize this, but your soul needs a speaking to. Because your soul is constantly talking. It's in the realm of the soul that we feel emotions. And emotions have a language. We call them love languages. And our soul is constantly speaking to our heart, constantly speaking to our mind, constantly speaking to our body. Did you know if you're down, depressed, you're more likely to get physically sick? Your soul speaks to your physical body. Do you know that if you allow your soul to run wild and to be in control of your body, it will lead you wherever your feelings are at day. Sometimes your mind is going to get a grip on your soul and say, even though I don't feel it, I know it. I know it. And you will come in line with what I know. And so David does some soul speaking. Every day we have this conversation. That's why it's so important to us as a church that we're engaging with God's word, doing this thing that we call soaping. Again, if you look in the Bible app notes, there's a whole segment in there and soaping. Soaping isn't using physical soap and washing yourself. That is a great daily habit, by the way. (laughs) Highly recommend that one if you haven't tried it. Okay, every single day, soaping, right? But SOAPing is an acronym. S stands for scripture. O stands for observation. A stands for application. P stands for prayer. And we encourage people as part of our church family to every day take a verse or a chapter or a scripture and to write down what the scripture is, then write down an observation of what you see happening. What, we, how, what do you see? Then how is what you're seeing God's word applying to you? And then pray that God would move in your life or grow in your life or do something in your life to make that thing become a reality. So you have to make sure that, that, you know, as our soul is speaking, we're speaking to our soul, that God is speaking to our soul. Because you know what? Time and time again you see in the, in the Psalms and in God's word is that very often when your soul says, I'm not well, 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 God's word says, it is good with my soul. It is good. With, even, even though it's probably not good, it will be good. Because the inner reality of my blessedness will overcome the external challenges of the lack of that that I see right now. David speaks to his soul. What he does, first of all, notice this, is he speaks to his soul. He doesn't, first of all, talk to himself. Later on, we're going to see next week how he, he, he talks about his own soul. But first of all, he focuses on who God is. He blesses God. He pours his, He literally throws himself fully into worship by saying, all of my inmost being praise his holy name. Verse 2, he repeats it. He picks up the exact same line. He emphasizes it. It's almost like his soul didn't hear him the first time. Kind of like as a married man when your wife says, Jamie, you're like, nah. Jamie! Whoa, I hear you. You know what I'm saying? It's like the second time gets our attention. David says, praise the Lord of my soul. Mm, praise the Lord of my soul. Okay. And what he uses to motivate us, so watch this in the second half of verse 2. He says, and forget not all of his benefits. You, you may find yourself in a position today where you, you, your soul may be struggling. I want to say, that's okay. I'm not saying that we should all be up here all the time. I'm saying that even when we're down, we can do some things that God can lift us above our circumstances. But even if you're here and you're struggling, I want to encourage you that David gives some keys as to how we can motivate our soul to praise. And the first one is that we forget not. 
All the things that he has done for us. Why? Because watch this. Track history reveals future trajectory. In other words, a person's past performance predicts their future potential. It's why when you apply for a job, people ask for a CV. They ask for references. And depending on how important the job is, the more you know, comprehensive the CV needs to be and the more references you have. I remember years ago when I was in the process of becoming an ordained minister. That's right, I am a reverend, just so you know. Don't ever call me that. Uh, I'm a reverend legally and all that kind of stuff. And when I was going through the process of what we call ordination, uh, you, you to, this is how serious it was. You had to apply for the application form. You, could, you didn't just, couldn't just get the application. You had to apply. There was a very simple, like, three or four-page application form. And then, once you were past that, then they gave you the application form. It was, like, that big. I mean, there was, like, 100 pages. They wanted to know everything about everything, about everything, about everything. It was huge. Why? Because becoming an ordained minister is a very important thing. And then, once it was complete and all the four references were checked out and I wasn't the crazy person, or at least not as crazy as I thought I was, then there was a two-year probationary process where basically you're still not there yet. You have a, a grueling interview, two-year basic process, then you have a, another interview, and if you make a trial, then you get to be. I mean, it's almost like joining the SAS, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, you know, just call me special forces. It's just crazy. It's, just, it's crazy. But all that was necessary. Why? Because the more we can understand someone's past performance, the more we can get a picture of their future, future potential. I'm not saying that we can't change. We can, but very often we don't. Now apply it to what David's doing. Apply it to God. When we look back at God's track history, as we survey his past performance, even if we haven't experienced it personally yet, we can see it as experience in the personal lives of those whose lives are contained in the pages of Scripture. What we see is that God is good. What we see is that God is merciful. What we see is that God is faithful. And because he has been, he will be and will always be. So praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not his benefits. Verse 3, and as what he does now is he begins to unpack then what some of these benefits are. What we're going to see is actually five benefits that David lists today to his own soul, to realign his soul, to refocus his soul on God, to remind his soul of the fact that he is blessed. So first one is this, the first benefit that we see that God has done, number one, is that he forgives all of your sins. He forgives all of your sins. At some point in your life, man or woman, let me speak to you for a second. You have to wrestle with what do you do with all the bad stuff you've accumulated in your life? Maybe you're young right now and the ledger isn't that red, it isn't that dark, there isn't that much stuff built up. But at some point you'll realize that you are not a great person. You may classify yourself as a good person, but you are not a great person. And there are things in your past, there are things in your life, there are things that have happened to you or you have done to others that you want to be rid of, be done with. Where can we go as human beings? Where do we turn to in order to deal with the issue of our sin? Religion can't solve it. More toys can't solve it. More money doesn't solve it. I mean, if more money and toys solved it, then everyone in the world who was rich and famous would be very happy. But why is it that people with all the money who live in the beaches of California still struggle with the same issues that you and I struggle with? Why are they riddled with depression? Why are they filled with guilt? Why do they take their own lives? Because at the end of the day, changing our circumstances doesn't change our reality. And our soul knows that the more we give ourselves over to sin, the more of ourselves that we lose. You talk to someone, you go visit someone in prison, you talk to someone who's done some very nasty things, and what you'll hear them so often express is this sense of losing themselves. When I was away last month, I watched this documentary about one of the most um, maximum security prisons in America. It's actually called Corcoran Penitentiary. How cool is that? (laughs) And uh, that's awesome. And, uh, and in this prison are all like, the bad of the bad, like, all these gang guys. You know, these are guys who literally, you know, one guy I was watching an interview of how he killed a whole bunch of people. And his first day in prison, he knew he had to lay down a mark. So he stabbed a guy to death his first day in prison. And then stabbed him in the cell. Well, this, is, this is terrible. And then later on, actually had dinner with the same utensil he used to stab the guy. I mean, just, just complete. How does a human being inflict this kind of destruction and just manage to be able to eat their dinner? I don't understand. It shows how 
evil, evil is. But the point is, you listen to his story behind all that kind of evilness was a very lost person who had lost themselves because of this process of continually giving themselves over to sin. Where can we go with the ledger of our sins? The good news of the gospel is there is somewhere we can go. There is a someone we can go to. There is a person who has done something about all the things that we have done. And he has loved us and he has saved us and he has, he has sacrificed himself for us so all of our sins can be picked up and carried away. Literally, you know, when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, the Lamb of God who was slain to take away the sins of the world, what the imagery is, as we heard before, and what reminds you again, is that literally God picked up all our sin from up on top of us and he took it away. We can be free today. You know that? You can, you can be set free. You can be forgiven. You can be released from your shame and your guilt and your past. And David's making the point to his soul that, you know, because of, what, of our faith in Jesus, this has already happened. For those who are Christ, Lord, this has already happened. God forgives all of our sins. What a, what a reason to rejoice. Secondly, and closely linked with this, is that he also heals all of our diseases. Forgiveness is a foundation for fellowship. Forgiveness is a foundation for coming back into relationships. And if someone upsets you or hurts you, if that relationship is restored, there needs to be forgiveness. Same is true us and, us and God. For us to be in a relationship with God, we must have forgiveness. But it doesn't finish there. Why? Because God also wants to heal us. He wants to experience wholeness. He wants to experience happiness. He wants to be, you know, in family, in relationship. It's one of the reasons why we take our connect group so seriously in this church. Because we're built for a community. And as we think about connectors, we see verse 3 speaks to the importance of why. Because even though forgiveness can happen in an instant, healing is always a process. And even though we can come on Sunday and lift our hands in worship or in surrender or in response and experience God's forgiveness in an instant, when we leave these doors shortly today, we need community, we need friends, we need accountability so that the healing process can work itself out so we don't just leave happy, but we also grow into wholeness. Are you with me here, church? Wholeness happens in the context of community. The second benefit is that God wants to heal our disease in, in, in a primary application sense. He's talking about salvation, that God has healed the brokenness that we experience between us as men and God. And, that's, and that salvation brings us close to him once again so that we all can experience proximity and relation with family. But secondly, it also speaks to the promise of physical healing. That miracles are possible. That we believe in a God whose track record is he heals the sick. He opens the eyes of the blind. He raises the dead. And because I think about all his benefits yesterday, I can pray and believe and find strength and hope from today that God who healed and God who saved yesterday can also heal and save today. None of us are beyond the, the reach of God's healing and saving power. How cool is that? How amazing is that? The third benefit we see is in verse 4 where David talks about how he redeems us, redeems our life from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion. And to understand this, we have to understand the imagery of what a pit actually is. I remember years ago when I was growing up, uh, we, my, my housing estate was originally like 12 houses, just 12 houses, you can picture that. And behind our house were all these fields. And then what happened was as the economy got better and they decided to buy the fields behind our house and the entire kind of fields became this huge construction site. Literally what's happening on an avenue, just overnight, literally diggers in there digging up the ground, preparing the soil for foundations. And within a year, there was two or 300 houses. Bam, just like that. Well, in that year, being like 11 years old, and living basically on the foot of a construction site, you can imagine all the fun that we had, all the mischief we got up to. Well, one time running through the construction site, and all of a sudden I fell into this pit. They dug this big pit. I think it was a rubbish pit. I'd fall into this thing, almost killed myself, to be honest with you, and I could not get out of it. I was stuck there. And I was calling. I'd run out by myself. My friend wasn't home from school yet. I was calling and calling and calling, and no one heard me. And eventually what happened was my friend who came to my house knew I wasn't there, knew I was on the site, came and he found me. And we worked out some kind of, I think he threw down a scaffolding piece of me and I worked my way out. But when you've experienced life in a pit, even though it's you know, a couple of hundred yards away from your back garden, all of a sudden you realize the imagery of what David is describing here. See, when you're in a pit, what you realize is that you're selfless, you're, you're, you're not selfless, you're unable, you don't have the ability or capacity to dig yourself out of this hole. You've dug yourself in so deep that right now you need help. You're in a position where you've, you've climbed so high and you've gotten so the only way you're getting down is someone comes to rescue you. Which is challenging when you're prideful, right? Because we want to be able to dig our way out, don't we? 
We want to be able to figure out. We want to be able to, you know, back ourselves out over messes. But sometimes there's some kinds of messes in our lives that are too big for us to figure it out. We need help. And the promise that David is showing us and reminding us of is that God is a God who doesn't judge us or stand over our pit, doesn't say, come up and get yourself into this, get yourself out of it. No, he's a God of mercy. He's a God of kindness. He's a God of compassion who rescues us from the pits that lead us ultimately to, to destruction. Maybe today you're here and you're in a pit. Maybe your soul's in a pit. Maybe your finances in a pit. Maybe your faith is in pit. I want to encourage you today. No matter how deep and how dark or how bad that pit is, God is able to rescue you. God is able to reach. To, you're not beyond the reaching power of his grace. The fourth benefit is almost linked to this also where you can imagine God taking someone out of his pit and then crowning someone. It's total contrast. Secondly, well, you're in the pit. You were lost. You're alone. Now you're lifted out of this thing. You're cleansed. You're clothed. You're given dignity and given a, a position of, of respect. And now you're crowned. And the crown is one of, we're told, love and compassion. What, what does a crown represent? A crown for a king. A crown represents his kingdom. It represents what he represented. The crown represented what he stood for. And how cool is that God does this incredibly transformative thing. He takes us from a pit from a hole, from our lostness, from our sinfulness, from our brokenness, he lifts us up and he repurposes us. He gives us something to stand for, something to live for, something to represent, and that is, of course, love and compassion. Let's just work through these again. Number one, God has forgiven us all of our sins. God heals us from all of our diseases. God rescues us from the pit of destruction. God crowns us and gives us purpose and direction. And fifth and finally, God satisfies our desires of good things so that our youth will be renewed like eagles. And again, that's, I could preach a whole message on that one verse. But how amazing, the fifth benefit that David mentions is that God will satisfy your mouth Amen. with good things. Amen. That he will give you what you need when you need it in a way that's always above and beyond what you need. Because he's God of abundantly more. He's a God who goes beyond. He's a God who surpasses. He's a God who surprises us with blessing. And there's this reference to how our youth will be renewed like eagles. And again, when we read that, we go, what does that mean? Well, back in the, in the time when this was written, one of the most myst mystical birds was the eagle. Because if you ever watch a bird flying around like a little swallow, swallows are doing this and they're flying. And if you watch a swallow for long, you, mean, you feel tired. You know what I'm saying? These things are all over the place. Hard work being a swallow. Even crows. But if something majestic about its eagle, they can just literally just stick out their wings, right? And soar for ages. It's effortless. Literally, biologically, they have this six foot, which is about a two meter wingspan. The way their feathers are orchestrated and ordered, the way their body is built, the aerodynamics of their, of, their, of, their, of their body means that literally they can soar effortlessly for long periods of time. And in ancient times, people would marvel at this. And they would use this observation as a form of, cons of comparison to talk about strength and endurance and not giving up. And what David is doing here is he's taking the same theme and saying, hey, when you have God on your side, when you lived a blessed life, when you walk in a sense of favor, when you've been forgiven of your sins, healed of your diseases, rescued from the pit, crowned with love and compassion, when God satisfies you, it's almost as if you're soaring through life. It's almost as if the obstacles come, but God gives you the ability to soar higher than them. Whoever is scurrying around and freaking out and losing their mind when the plane's about to crash and everyone's freaking out because of fire brigades and ambulances and everything, you're just sitting there calmly. This plane isn't going down. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I know where I'm going. I know who I belong to. I know whose I am. And I know that God is working on my behalf. I'm blessed. The world is freaking out. Economy and money and houses and taxation and careers and future. If I don't do this, I won't get that. And freaking out, we can sit back and relax and lift our hands in worship and say, wow, oh my soul, it is well. Why? Because I soar on wings like eagles. Well, because my strength is not found in my ability or my effort, but in whose I am. I want to encourage you today that because 
If you put your faith in Jesus, you're, you're a child of God, that God will cause us to soar wings like eagles. So my question as I bring this whole message to a close right now is this. Very simply, where do you need to be happy and whole? What part of your life today are you sitting there thinking, man, I want to experience the blessedness of God in my life. I want to be happy. I want to be whole. We, as we transition to this new season of life for our, our marriages, for our friendships, for our businesses, our schools, our workplaces, in our health, in our family, wh- where do you need to be happy and whole? I want to encourage you, if you're a Christ follower today, you are blessed. That is your declaration. Tell your soul, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And even though it doesn't look like you're blessed, you are blessed. And recount those, those, those truths, those reasons, the forgiveness of your sins, the rest of your pit. And as we worship God, allow him to work in us so that we can leave this place happy and blessed. And if you're here and you're not a Christ follower, I want to encourage you, you can experience this blessing today by simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus. By taking your next step, by going to the next step and figuring out what has God got for you, how has he wired you, and what's your extraordinary purpose? I want us to know today that it is possible for every single one of us to not just know, but to experience the blessing of God. And it's one of the reasons why, as we go into response time now, I chose this song. Today we're going to launch a brand new song. For a band you've probably heard of them called Ren Collective, an Irish worship band. And this song is called Counting Every Blessing. Literally, how the song goes in verse 1 is it says, I was blind but now I'm seeing color. I was dead, but now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I want to encourage you there as we go into this time, we're going to speak to our souls. We're going to do some soul speak. We're going to adjust our focus. And even though nothing changed in our circumstances, everything is about to change in our character. My prayer as we go into this moment of response, as we, go into, as we progress through this series, is that God is going to do something in us that we can, we can say with confidence, we can walk in our identity as God's people and show the world what it means to be blessed. Amen? I want you to stand. I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing this song together. The worship team, come on up. So Father, I thank you today for all the great things you've done for us. For every person sitting in this room right now, watching online or to all our family in Dublin, wherever we are, we just thank you that you are God who first of all forgives us of our sins. That you are God who secondly heals us of all our diseases. That you are God who rescues us from the pit of destruction. That you're a God who crowns us with love and compassion. That you're a God who promises to satisfy us with good things so that we can soar wings like eagles. We don't need to manufacture our own blessing. We don't need to manufacture our own miracle. We can rest in you. We speak to our soul today and we say, soul, you are blessed. I am blessed. blessed. We are blessed. We choose to reorganize or refocus ourselves on you, God. As we walk through this series, I pray that we'd experience that blessing in our lives. Help us, I pray, to count every blessing and to live out our extraordinary purpose as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.